Recently, several listeners asked what was going to happen with the serial story, The Fifth World, which started in November 2021 and ran to the beginning of February 2022. In response to these inquiries, today's episode is the next chapter in that story. If you have not heard the first four installments, please head back to our November 17th, December 17th, January 1st, and February 1st episodes to catch up. We hope you enjoy the story, and let us know if you want us to keep going with this serial tale by sending us an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com. Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 240, The Fifth World, Chapter 5. Read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, intelligence might not be conscious. These dispatches are my recollection of events on the fifth world. We had been tasked to observe that planet and to intervene, if necessary, in order to divert it from the precipice it was about to fall into. As I have already described, through a misunderstanding of the world's social structure and a catastrophic descent from orbit, the mission was derailed right from the start. I found myself in the role of an agricola, an indentured farm laborer that no one here would give a second glance at, let alone heed their advice. Through happenstance, the artificial mind which nurtured me on my long voyage was forced to take refuge in the body of my new companion, an agricola named Opertarius. It was a suboptimal arrangement, but, nevertheless, it gave me access to my colleague, mentor, and friend. However, without the means to complete our mission or leave the fifth world, I am not sure where we will end up. However, the entry below is a description of some of the events which have led to the present situation. They're on the third floor, someone outside yelled as the sound of boots echoed up the stairwell. Stay right where you are. The tech, who was supposed to be fixing our ankle trackers, ordered from behind her wire work cage. And maybe they'll go easy on you. Run and you'll wish you were never born. Without thinking, I jumped at the door of her workspace, slammed it shut, and jammed its latch with a metal rod to buy us some time. Lock the front door, I yelled at Opertarius. That's stupid, you dumb Agricola. The tech growled bearing teeth stained green from eating unprocessed krava. Now, I can claim you were trying to rob me as well as escape. You'll end up working underground for the rest of your worthless lives. I ignored the woman as she continued to hurl insults at us and looked desperately around the small shop for another way out. She noticed me eyeing the window. Be my guest, she taunted. Jump! It's only three stories down to the concrete. You'll save us all a lot of time and money. Look up. Ship pushed the image of a small skylight into my mind. But it was too high to reach. We can use the benches to get to it, I suggested, then realized they were bolted to the floor. Still fighting for control, Ship forced Opertarius to sweep the electronics off a display table near the repair cage. Hey, the tech rattled the cage door, trying to force it open. That's some of my best stock. Your owner's going to have to pay for that. I helped push the empty table over to the skylight. Hurry, Ship urged. Boots pounded onto the landing outside the shop. This is interdiction. Open up, a deep voice demanded, then began trying to force the door. We only had a few seconds before they got in. 
I clambered up on the table and stretched as high as I could. My claws just reached the latch on the skylight. I flipped it open, then jumped and pulled at the same time, scrambling to grasp for a hold. Suddenly, I could feel a push from behind. Ship had managed to force Operterius onto the table to give the extra boost I needed, and I flopped out onto the roof like a beached whale. As I turned around to offer a hand to pull Operterius up, the door exploded inward and six burly, uniformed rodentians crashed through, fur on edge with anger and anticipation. Grab my foreleg, I encouraged, but Ship was struggling to control Operterius. They stood, frozen, by competing wills as the leader of the interdiction squad yelled at them to get down. Finally, Ship seemed to momentarily win and Operterius reached up and jumped. I grabbed their paws and pulled as hard as I could. They were halfway through, then stopped, seemingly stuck in the opening. They've got us. Ship shared an image of three rodentians clawing at Operterius's legs. He grimaced and began to slide back inside. There was a flash of blue light, screams of pain, and Operterius suddenly popped out onto the roof beside me. I caught an acrid whiff of burnt fur as I slammed the skylight shut. The two of us ran to the edge, jumped onto the roof of an unfinished building next door, and from there clambered down the old scaffolding into a lane where we waited for a group of agricolas to pass by, then fell in behind them. I heard yelling and cursing from the roof, but ignored it doing my best to look like the other obedient Agricola we were following. There was a commotion in the street behind as another interdiction squad pushed their way through the crowds towards us. I spotted a narrow lane and pulled Operterius into it, then forced him to hide behind a garbage container. We waited while the interdiction agents passed, then heard the supervisor, who had been leading the group of Agricolas, complain as the agent started checking his workers' trackers. Operterius, we've got to leave, I insisted. They'll be back. Operterius refused to move. It's getting harder without his cooperation, Ship sent to my mind. But we need to leave. Cooperation will have to wait. Just force him again. I pushed back to the AI. I grabbed Operterius' arm and half-dragged him down the rubbish-filled lane, looking for a way out. What was that flash of light back at the repair shop? I asked Ship, mind to mind, once we had turned a corner and were out of the line of sight of the street. I caused the tracking bracelet on this body's ankle to discharge its battery, Ship explained. That caused an overload and was the source of the flash when it arced between the rodentians holding on to us. They received a brief but significant shock. I looked at Operterius's left ankle, winced at the burnt fur, and noticed for the first time how he was favoring it. That looks sore. Operterius nodded, then said, I don't know what's happened to me, Kalo. Feels like I'm a puppet. My legs and arms move by themselves. Why are we running? We've done nothing. Interdiction always thinks anyone who flees is guilty of something. I heard sounds behind us in the alley. Come on, we've got to get going, I urged. I'm not going anywhere until you explain, Operterius said stubbornly. He's making this very difficult, Ship informed me. You have that look again, Operterius accused. It started in the repair shop, like you're listening to something only you can hear. There were noises at the entrance to the lane, and someone yelled. They've got to be in there. It's the only alley between here and the shop. There was a cacophony of crashes and bangs as garbage cans were overturned and trash thrown out of the way. I'll explain when we're safe, I said, trying to push Operterius forward. He looked at me defiantly and began to yell. Hey, we're down here, 
he managed to choke out before Ship caused his throat to constrict. The banging garbage can suddenly stopped. Desperate, I grabbed Operterius's hand and started pulling him along. After a few steps, he stopped struggling. I can't do this much longer, Ship complained. We quietly made our way to an intersection with an even narrower lane, which was a little more than a gap between buildings, so tight that no light made its way in. I took a chance and turned into it, following it until it ended at the back of a tall brick building. There was a fire escape just out of reach. I cursed. I'm not going to go any further until you explain, Operterius demanded, then slumped down against the wall. I turned and listened for our pursuers. In the distance, I could hear them slowly banging their way through the rubbish to the intersection. We can't stay here, Operterius. We can't afford to be caught. I said, but was informed by ship that at the moment it could do nothing to make his body cooperate. I needed to distract Operterius's mind. Okay. I finally conceded and explained that the small metal box he had taken from me back in the Krava field yesterday contained an artificial mind, which, in an effort to find power, had inadvertently attracted the negative charges built up in the storm clouds. The resulting lightning strike destroyed the box, and the mind was forced to find refuge anywhere it could. If I had been closer, I admitted, it would have used me, but... I was too far away. So, it turned to the only available storage medium. The junk DNA in your body. So, your box infected me? Operterius accused. Why? No, no, it's not a disease. I corrected. It's a type of self-learning computer program that encoded itself into your unused DNA it had nowhere else to go. It was an accident. It will leave you if we can find another medium and enough energy for it to transfer. I've never heard of such a crazy thing, Operterius objected. Self-driving machines, like the harvesters, are everywhere, but something that can invade and control a body? Who are you? Some kind of Ratufin spy? I don't think they even have machines like that. Operterius said suspiciously and scrambled up onto his hind legs. I could see his muscles tense, getting ready to spring at me. I can't move, he gagged on the words. What? Who are you? Get, get, get out of me. Operterius clawed at his chest as if he could rip Ship out. Keep him quiet, Ship. I'm trying, Ship sent back. I decided to take a chance, hoping Operterius would believe me. Listen, Operterius, we're not from your world. We're here by accident. I lied, suspecting that telling him about our mission would only make him more suspicious. We accidentally crashed into that Krava field. The space junk Colrin had us clean up was the remains of our descent vehicle. We collided with orbital debris on our way down and lost control. We're trapped here. We just want to find a way to leave. We can't afford to be caught. We need your help. Operterius appeared to stop struggling with ship, then stood still, eyes focused on something behind me, and smiled. I swiveled and found myself face to face with a large, uniformed rodentian. One paw held a small, flat screen, its glowing face showing one green and two red dots almost merging. You can't escape, Agricola, the agent gloated. Just come with me and I won't have to use this. He brandished a shock baton at my chest, its end a blister of blue, arcing electricity. I instinctively stepped back. I, uh, I, I mean, we're, we're just lost. We're not trying to escape. 
I tried to stall while I desperately thought of a way out. Operteria suddenly jerked forward, causing the interdiction agent to swing the shock baton toward him. Without hesitating, Operterius reached out and a thin blue line of ragged light jumped between his hand and the energized weapon. At first, I thought the thing had misfired. Then, for a split second, nothing happened. The interdiction agent looked at his paw holding the rod in bewilderment. Without warning, electricity arced up his foreleg and across his chest. The rodentian convulsed and fell to the ground, twitching. Was that you? I asked Ship, but before my artificial companion could reply, I heard someone yell at the entrance to the dead end lane. It says they're down there, they explained. While Operteria stood confused, gawking at his finger, I spun him around to face the wall. Quick, get on my shoulders. I'll boost you up to the fire escape, then you can let down the ladder for me. The sound of feet crunching through garbage began to echo down the lane. Three, maybe four rodentians were rapidly approaching. I could feel a struggle take place in Operterius, until some impasse seemed to have been crossed. Then he jumped on my back, reached up, grabbed the first rung of the fire escape, and clambered up. His weight caused the retractable ladder to slide down. I scampered up to the first landing where Operterius was waiting and jumped off. We helped the ladder slide back up into place, then began to race up the rickety metal stairs. They're on the fire escape, an interdiction agent shouted. Don't look back, just keep going, I urged. There was a sudden clunk and rattle, then the whole fire escape began to shake as several meaty agents grabbed for the ladder and began to climb. At the top floor, another ladder led to the roof, which looked like it hadn't been used in years. The metal cleats connecting to the wall were rusted and some looked loose, but we had no choice. I pushed Operterius up, his weight causing the ladder to immediately complain. It won't hold two of us. We'll have to go one at a time. I projected to Ship, who agreed. Ship forced Operterius up, stopping each time one of the cleats complained. Finally, he made it to the roof and waved for me to follow. I looked down and saw an interdiction agent only a floor below. Instead of easing onto the ladder, I jumped onto the second rung. Two of the cleats pulled out of the crumbling brick wall. I froze for a second, then tried to redistribute my weight, but another cleat started working its way loose. I carefully stepped up a few more rungs, my heart's trying to jump out of my chest. Operterius was hanging over the top, paws stretched down toward me. A small avalanche of broken bricks cascaded down the side of the building when the third cleat finally failed, and immediately the ladder began to pull away from the building. Jump, Ship encouraged. I scrambled up a few more rungs, then pushed off with all my strength. The ladder reacted by groaning and swinging away, pivoting around the one remaining cleat. I seemed to hang, suspended in the air for a moment, before Operterius grabbed my forelegs and fell back onto the roof, pulling me up and over. I heard the ladder finally give way and bang down into the lane below. It was followed by a curse and the sound of breaking glass. They're going to get to the roof from the inside, Ship said, this time using Operterius' vocal cords. We looked around for a way to escape, but the other buildings were either too far away or too low for us to jump and we could already hear heavy footsteps racing up the interior stairs to the rooftop access door on the far side of the building. There was a screech, like protesting metal and a hatch we hadn't noticed before, jerked open near the center of the roof. We're trapped, I yelled. Instead of a bulky interdiction agent, a slight rodentian poked out of the opening. Quick! 
it encouraged and waved us over. Interdiction is almost to the roof. We don't have much time. Go, Chip encouraged. I dropped through the hatch, followed by Operatarius. The strange rodentian closed and latched the hatch with a reassuring clunk. That won't hold them long. We need to leave, our new friend explained, then reached into a shoulder bag, pulled out some type of instrument, and held it to each of our ankle trackers until there was a sizzling sound. She passed another smaller device over our trackers, then, seemingly satisfied, packed up her gear. They were tracking you through the pass of electrostatic couplings. The city is infested with sensors, she explained, then led us to a stairwell. Go down, quietly. Who are, I began to ask. Shh, no time, I'll tell you later. Uh, quickly now, go down. The stairwell wasn't lit and smelled like it had been used as a makeshift latrine. We had to feel our way down to the bottom. Once there, our guide opened a small door which had been disguised as an electrical panel and encouraged us to squeeze through it. On the other side, there was another rodentian who handed us headlamps. We put them on and found ourselves in a tunnel barely wider than two bodies. Hello, my name is Impidens. We know what you are and are here to help. Shift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To get other great APN podcasts, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com, where you'll find Bollywood is for Lovers. Join hosts Matt Bowes and Aaron Frazier as they explore the world of Hindi cinema through the lens of two Canadian cinephiles. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by the Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by Pod Power. With Pod Power, our sponsors are making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This episode, Edmonton Community Foundation is helping us give a Pod Power shout out to Overdue Finds. Overdue Finds is an Edmonton Public Library podcast. Bryce Crittenden and Caroline Land host conversations about books, movies, music, pop culture, and other interesting news about Edmonton. It's a great way to learn more about what's happening at EPL and about how you can use your library card to access all of EPL's in-person and online services. To listen and find out more about Overdue Finds, head to epl.ca slash podcast. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production by Spatialized Audio. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories, 
just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.